Hello everyone, my name is Brandon Keith and welcome to this video where we're going to talk about pen testing contracts. Now this is for a specific class I teach. If you are here at this video, you probably know which course this is for. If not, this is just a great introduction to talking about how pen testing contracting is done. So for this video, we're going to take a look at pen test USA LLC. They're a company that on the web, they have one of their penetration testing contracts. They have it available that you can peruse. If you've ever thought of doing penetration testing, maybe you're looking at starting your own firm, maybe you're looking at joining a firm, this is gonna help give you some insight into exactly what goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of negotiation that happens in what we call the pre-engagement phase of a penetration test. That is all the negotiations, making sure all the paperwork is signed, making sure you're not holding a, a pen tester or ethical hacker liable for damages. Things can and do go wrong during a penetration test. So with that, let's go ahead and let's dive in. So you'll notice some boilerplate things. So some of the first things you'll see here is we will see it's agreed upon by all parties that you agree uh, to this. Um, and it's gonna specify both internal and external penetration testing. So you'll see that term used a lot. Internal means inside network. So that is inside a firewall. So think of a Comcast firewall or a Comcast, not firewall, router. If you have a router at home, that is your internal network. External is anything externally facing. So think about a website, a firewall, any devices that might be externally to a network. When we're talking internal pen testing, we're talking about inside a network. So that's the difference there. So no assets, this is Super important, no assets not identified in this contract will be tested barring stipulations defined below. That is incredibly important. You do not want to test things that aren't in your penetration testing project. If we compared this to if you were paying someone to break into a building and they broke into the wrong building, that would be a bad thing. That's happened sometimes. Uh, if you think if you went to a friend's house and you just opened the door and you were entering the wrong house, you would be breaking and entering. Maybe your friend gave you permission to come into their house, you didn't need to knock. Um, if you went into the wrong house, that would still be trespassing. Same thing when we're doing a penetration test, we're being given permission to break into a system. If we break into the wrong system, that's not going to be good. Uh, so some legalese here, an attack or test launch at the asset defined for testing potential, we can relay or otherwise proxy a test. Uh, currently on Benosa pen test. So this refers to, there is a lot of different uh, proxy methods a lot of different ways to trip up and trick devices. So we're talking like DNS poisoning uh, methods, IP address poisoning, all kinds of different poisoning methods. Art poisoning specifically is definitely one that's used a lot when we are talking about different kinds of attacks that can impact out of scope targets, right? Because they get caught up in it. So this is kind of clarifying where we will not intentionally attack out of scope targets. So this is pretty, I've seen a lot of other pen testing uh, boilerplate before. This is pretty boilerplate in that uh, that's needed, right? It's here for a reason. Uh, and here, penetration testing is in fact mainly comprised of conducting reconnaissance on attacks on assets. So this is saying, do you understand that we're gonna be simulating an attack? And this is, this is incredibly important for when we talk about if there's ever any suing or legal, uh, team is not intent on causing any damage or there's no intention of harm, right? So any harm to the company or devices as a result of a penetration test is gonna be accidental. So we see a lot of those things. So this is more boilerplate of that. Um, any assets that wanna be tested, it's gonna talk specifically about inter external penetration testing conducted from their premises while internal testing. So when you're doing internal testing, a lot of times, especially after COVID, it's moved from being on site. Uh, when I used to do penetration testing, we used to do a lot of it on site. Now a lot of it is done uh, remotely via some kind of VPN connection or they call them drop boxes. It could be a Raspberry Pi or a Intel Nook that gets dropped in and there's a VPN to that device. And from that internal device, they plug it in somewhere internally in their network and all the testing gets done specifically from that device. 
Uh, so that's some of the, the differences that are laid out here in the contract. Good to see them talking about those things in this contract. Uh, Pentest USA is laying out quite a bit in their contract. This is a really great sample to conduct, and I'll post the full link. You can see it up above here, uh, but I'll post the full link so you can just copy and paste that in the uh, d YouTube description below. All right, let's take a look at services and scheduling for this. So I, I really love the way they laid this out. So they have the services performed, internal pen testing, uh, what are the products provided? This is so great because there's a lot of contracts where for penetration testing where the deliverable is not very clear. And generally a deliverable of a pen test is normally a report and sometimes a presentation that goes up along with the report and sometimes the results. Uh, for example, when I did penetration testing, we delivered the report, uh, which had all the results and we delivered a presentation and we delivered a command line log of all the tools we use. So we would, we would first thing we did in a pen test, increase bash history, like as far as you can. And we would give a full log of all the different commands we ran and all the different tools we use. So if someone wanted to see and trace back exactly what all the commands we ran as penetration testers, they absolutely could, right? And, our, and some of our clients really liked that because they could kind of go back through and understand and dig in and say, hey, this is, uh, this is exactly how they did it. So to stop this, these are some of the things we need to do. And we point that out, obviously, in the report and presentation. Not every pen penetration testing firm is going to be the same. Some are going to be uh, better than others. So you can see here some, these are general boilerplate, and this is a template. As you can see, hourly rate, total contract rate. For a lot of penetration testing engagements, you will see there is a lot of flat rates. There's a lot of hourly rates, just depends on the company. So external, internal, and external. Some basic information. The start dates and end dates, incredibly important. I worked on a penetration test where we did not, where those start and end dates, we actually included times for all the testing too, which was really important because this client actually got attacked by an adversary during our tests. And we could show from our start and end times that we were keeping track of that we were not testing during the time that they, they thought it was us attacking their, their system. And it wasn't, it was actually an external actor, a threat actor that was attacking. So having that information, really important. The more organized you are when doing a pen, penetration test, the better. All right, approved uh, in scope targets, incredibly important here. What are the domain names being tested? If it's a if it's a website, if you're doing Whois lookups, whatever you're doing to that domain, whatever you're running, what is in scope and what is the external IP addresses in scope and internal IP addresses and ranges in scope. Not having these is kind of a no-go for most pen penetration tests. You don't see as many black box tests where they just give you like a domain name and say go uh, or figure it out a lot of times it's going to be a little bit of gray box. You're gonna to wanna to see all of those external and internal IP addresses listed out. And that's like a liability thing. You don't wanna, again, go into the wrong house that you don't have permission to try to break into. So this is by and far one of the most important parts. Everything in this contract is important to stay safe and make sure you're doing everything uh, legally in the right way. Uh, and obviously you wanna consult any state licensures that you might have or country license licenses or laws not licenses laws that may be part of this uh, but this gives you a good idea of the contract and then there's an agreement section so this gives you an idea a little bit better idea of what we're talking about uh, when we talk about a penetration testing contract and what's going on in that pre-engagement phase we talk a lot about the different penetration testing methodologies. I still love uh, PTES. It's still one of my favorite ones. I wrote an entire article on LinkedIn on that if you want to check that out on my LinkedIn. But it is still hands down, I think the the best, one of the best methodologies. There's a lot of other ones, but almost all of them have some kind of pre-engagement phase. And a lot of that has to do with this kind of contract negotiation. All right. I think that's about it for this video. I will see you in the next one.